Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? As you can see, my better half is missing, um, so it, um, we're going to make do with what we have. Um, I ask you guys to just keep her in your prayers today. She's under the weather. Um, if you guys would go ahead and stand with us, we can begin our time of worship. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel the empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And it's good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears, broken dreams and wasted years, until the past to disappear, oh, let me tell you about my Jesus, and all the wrong turns that you would, and none do. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Who would take my cross to Calvary? Pay the price for all the guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Who 
understands the heart of a sinner showers in grace over all our mistakes washes us clean with his blood Jesus does who sings the song of sweet forgiveness who stole the keys to heaven and the grave who has the power to save Jesus does so we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son praise to the Spirit who's living in us I was a sinner he saved me from who I was oh that's what Jesus does and oh what a friend oh what a savior he's always been good he's always been faith he came to my rest when I needed him most he said Give us the sun, praise to the Spirit, He's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. So we sing praise to the Father, give us the sun, praise to the Spirit, Good morning, everyone. As we prepare for our communion time this morning, I'm just going to read some verses for you this morning for our communion devotion. If you're a baptized believer in Jesus, we ask you to take communion with us. You're more than welcome. Our scripture uh, reading this morning is found out of Luke 22, verse 7. It's entitled, The Last Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said unto them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it, it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of heaven comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. So as we take communion this morning, let's remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. And I like the story where it says they found it just as Jesus told them. Jesus will do what he says. God does what he says he will do. So as we take communion this morning, just remember his sacrifice for you, that we may have a home in heaven. I'll go ahead and pray and you can take your communion. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. For we are sinners in need of a Savior. 
Just be with us this day, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I will go ahead and pray for our offerings this morning. If you feel led to give, we encourage you to do so. Offering boxes are in the front of the church. And just remember that God owns it all, and we need to give back to Him. Father God, we just thank you for the blessings you've allowed us to have, provided our needs, heal us when we're sick, provide monies when we need them. Father God, we just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.
We all know that a picture speaks a thousand words, and oftentimes we can learn more from a picture than a lot of words. And so Jesus used the idea of pictures to teach people. By the way, have you noticed this morning all the singing, all the songs kept up bring, bringing up a name? Did you notice the name? What's the name? Jesus. Do you know? And I've heard this of churches in the United States that there are churches that do this, but there are churches that will have an entire service and never mention the name of Jesus. Have you heard of that? Now, I've got a word for that, and you all know what that word is? That's hogwash. We're here because of the name of Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus. That's what we're about. Now, a lot of these church families, they'll talk about things of self-esteem or, or, or all these sorts of things. They'll sing songs of positivity and things of that nature. But I am here to tell you, and I think probably most of you in this room know it, that if it wasn't for the Creator, God Almighty, His Son, Jesus Christ, that made a way for us, there isn't hope for a single one of us in this room. We get that? Before I get into all the sermon today, let's pray and uh, we'll study. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you so much for making a way for us. I know that we've been liars, stealers, thieves, adulterers, murderers, all these things, Lord. We are sinners saved through the beauty of your life and your grace, Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed for me and for each of these men and women, for all of us that are worshiping together whether here in this place, online, however it may be, we worship the name of you, Jesus Christ. We lay our down our lives before you. We ask for your healing and restoration. As we study your word today, we pray for you, Holy Spirit, to lead, guide, and counsel, and to use us however you see fit. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, We'll start this morning into the study of Matthew chapter 13, along with a question that you all, many of you in this room have heard before, but has anyone in this room told a lie? Is there any liars in the room today? All right. Have any of you committed sin this week? I would guess probably, it looks like all of you, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying from the appearance of things. But God's Word teaches us, you know, that if we have done those things, we're, we're liars, we're sinners, and, you know, those weigh heavily on us, and, and we, they should eat at our hearts. Now, I've asked a question before, but on a scale of 0 to 10, how righteous are you in this room today? If you're liars and thieves and stealers, you've committed sin this week, how righteous of people are you on a scale of 0 to 10? Wow, we got some very self-confident people. Actually, knowing their answer, we know that that ain't an issue of self-confidence, right? Because the follow-up question to that, and most of you know it already, on a scale of 0 to 10, how righteous is Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, we would say he's an absolute perfect 10. He's above a 10, and the Scriptures teach us. The gospel message is that for us sinners that have laid down our lives and claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I can tell you, personally, age 17, that's what changed me for all eternity. I'm literally, and I know I'm a big strapping guy, right? But at the age of 17, I was a guy crying myself to sleep at night. I was the youngest kid. My brothers had all gone off to college. I was home alone. I didn't feel accepted by people. I felt like I was a little chubby and people liked making fun of my chubs, all that kind of stuff. And I was crying myself to sleep many times thinking that nobody would care. Nobody would even think about if I was gone. And I would lay there and have those thoughts. But since giving my life to Jesus... I have never felt that again. There's a reason for that. Scripture literally teaches us that every single one in this room, you look around, even if you think somebody looks a little weird here today, okay, outwardly, whatever the case is, God tells us in his word that we have been created in the image of him. 
that we are his beings in creation, that in our lives that we have been created in his image. Therefore, the void that we feel in life so often, many of you don't feel that anymore, praise God. But the void we feel is because of the confusion that comes from not knowing whose image we've been created in. We're literally living in a culture where people are like, oh, I don't know this, I don't know that. We're confused about all these things. But the confusion needs to come back to who Jesus Christ is. And my friends, I'm here to tell you, Satan is doing a terrific job of distorting that picture. If we can take churches here in the U.S. and not even mention the name of Jesus, he's already winning. And I'm not talking about Jesus, I'm talking about Satan. God tells us that it was by his son, by his grace, by his mercy, that we can have faith in God and in Jesus Christ to have salvation. Now, when I say picture this, anybody know what flag that is here on the screen? Recognize that flag? That is the flag of Tanzania. We're going to be talking about planting seeds. The Bible talks about if we have a seed as small as a mustard seed, what can happen with that? A lot of you know, less than a decade ago, we started that work in Tanzania. We started planting a little seed. Uh, I think probably most of you realize I never had a lick in me wanting to do that, okay? Uh, I never felt like I wanted to leave out of the country. I like being at home. But God called us to something different and called something different in me. We planted a seed. A lot of you already know. Many churches, schools, now an orphanage that we're working on. Eight water wells, over 100,000 people with clean water, hundreds and hundreds of people that have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Muslims that have become Christians that are now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. All of these things are happening because a seed was planted. And this is what the scriptures teach about that seed and about the seed of faith, and that's what we're looking at today. Something will grow. Now understand this, something's going to grow. And uh, I've experienced it in a number of different ways because I'm not the best at taking care of stuff sometimes. Like, I've tried gardening. But uh, my dad, when I was a kid, we had almost an acre of land that was a garden, and he'd make us go out and pull the weeds every day and hoe, and you, it had to look immaculate. I don't want to do all that work. They sell it in cans at the store, all right? But I've tried gardening, and... The way I took care of my garden, guess what? This phrase, something will grow. Guess what growed? Weeds, grass, all that grew up, and I didn't get very good outcomes, okay? Something will grow, and in us, listen to this, every one of you in this room, something will grow. Whether it's your faith and hope in Jesus, or whether it's despair, depression, discontentment, these things are going to grow. God teaches us that we have a part to play in it, that we need to turn it over to him. Look what it says here in the Word. It says in Matthew chapter 13, starting verse 31, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in, it, in their branches. Think about that for a moment. we got the picture of this little bitty mustard seed when it grows. And here's a picture of a tree that's kind of supposed to be one of those mustard seed trees. I did a little study on it. Some uh, different versions will grow up to 6 feet, which isn't maybe that big. But then some will grow up to 30 feet big, these mustard seeds. That's impressive. This is a picture that Jesus uses of faith. In his people, that that faith, the smallest of mustard seed, can grow and do mighty and incredible things. Now, the question is going to be for each of us in this room, whether we've received Jesus Christ or not, is what is growing inside of us? Now, this next part we look at is the power of faith. And, you know, I think to this question, especially this morning when we've been hearing the name of Jesus so many times and all the songs we've been singing today, Jesus, 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 is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Is he powerful? Does he make a difference? You know, can we have church service today with no Jesus? 
Can we just come in here and have good fellowship, encouragement to each other, pat each other on the back, send each other out? Can we do church that way? My friends, that's the question I'm asking because in churches, some places today, they sing songs just of no worth to the name of Jesus, just encouraging positive, light, all these sorts of things apart from Jesus. My friends, I want to be the first to tell you, I shouldn't be on this stage if it isn't for Jesus. You shouldn't ever listen to a sermon that doesn't have Jesus in it. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other answer except through him. So we look at the power of faith. This next part says, He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through all the dough. Do you get that picture? We got any bakers in the room? Baker, baker, candlestick maker? Any bakers? So, yeast, what's it do? Well, it makes things rise. Uses the illustration here that just a little bit of yeast spread through all that dough is going to make that bread rise. Those muffins, whatever it is, pancakes, all those sorts of things that get a little fluffier with that yeast, right? Says that of our faith. Now, here's the thing, and we've talked about it in this house before, that if you're the only Christian man or woman left in Mount Vernon, Illinois, does Christianity die with you? Or does it continue on? Christianity is not a faith that's meant to be an isolated thing. It's meant to be something that grows, that expands out to other people. That we're to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're to spread the love of Jesus because of who he is. Factually who Jesus Christ is. Not because it's just something I want or desire, but because of who he is. The creator, God Almighty, who was there in the beginning of creation, that was there when you were formed. That's who we should listen to. That's who we should desire. And that faith is very powerful and can do amazing things. Now, this next portion of what it says in these verses, this idea of being revealed. We need to understand when it talks about being revealed and we look at the passages... That all we know of God is what God has revealed to us. I seen a comment on social media this last week that talked to that nature. Somebody said, how does anybody uh, suppose, uh, presuppose that they can have anything to know the mind of God? Well, Scripture speaks to that. Literally says that his creation, his stars, everything he's made reveals that he's there, that he's God. Tells us in the word, the truth of God, and what he reveals to us. In this passage, it says, verse 34, that Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. Remember, talking about in stories, pictures, illustrations. It says here, uh, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. Verse 35, so it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouths in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is Jesus Christ revealing this. This comes from Psalms chapter 78 where it says, O oh my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouths in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old what we have heard and known, it goes on, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. Are you catching all this? How do we know who God is? How do we know that Jesus Christ is the name that needs to be lifted above all other names? Because he has revealed it. It said that he shared all those things in pictures and stories and illustration so that people would get it. Here in Psalm 78, when we read what he was quoting, Jesus Christ himself was quoting, what's the following verses? It says that you and I would tell these things to whom? To the children, to the next generation that we would tell the wonders of God and Jesus Christ, and then we would tell them the things that are praiseworthy in and of him, Jesus. History repeats itself, does it not? And if you've ever read through the Bible, you see that history repeats itself 
over and over like a broken record. Literally in the Old Testament, we read of how God pours out his blessing upon people. They cry out to God for his salvation, his provision. God provides those things, and then the people turn their backs towards God. And they start liking all the material stuff and all the money and all the physical things, and they cry out for that. And then they lose God, and then they cry out for God again, and they turn back. This pendulum this is, keeps swinging back and forth, and we see it in our culture right now. We literally are seeing people turning away from God or from Jesus, even in church service. I, for one, hopefully everybody sitting in this room or worshiping with us online today, want to make sure that is never the case here at Southwest Christian Church. We will proclaim Jesus Christ with our last breath. I have nothing to tell you or share with you, any stories, anything that's fascinating or wonderful, apart from the name of Jesus Christ. You ever think about that? It always seems like the preacher has the best stories, but he's the only guy that's up in front of everybody telling all these sorts of things. You guys all have wonderful stories. If you don't think that's true, catch any restaurant here in Mount Vernon between the time of 5 a.m. and 7 a.m., And you're going to find all the old fellers from the community sharing all their great stories. And you guys know how that goes, right? I mean, I was a good athlete when I was in high school. But, man, now the stories I tell, I'm much better. All right? Time makes it better, right? Don't let the wrong thing grow. As I was talking about with the garden, I was letting the weeds and the grass grow. And we know what that does. Don't let despair, discontent, those kind of things grow in you. Uh, Any worriers in the room? Matter of fact, little commercial. Our upcoming sermon series is going to be from worry to worship. That's what God directs us in. So if you're a worrier or you're letting those things grow inside of you, discontent, uh, not being happy in life, depression, all those sorts of things, God gives us some direction and answer to those things. Don't let the wrong thing grow. Luke chapter 17, verse 1 through 10, it says that Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But, and catch the but here, it's a big important thing, but woe to that person through whom they come. Are we going to be those people? Goes on to say, verse 2, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So, and catch what the last couple of words here of this is. So watch the news and all the media people. Watch all those teachers and manipulators. Watch all those other people. Is that what it says? It says, watch yourselves. Wow. Think of the context of this. What's it saying here? Listen, it's literally telling us as adults, especially Christian adults, that if we're causing a little one to stumble or sin, or we're doing things that's setting in a bad example, or we're living lives in ways that are contrary to what Jesus Christ teach, it said it would be better off to, for what to happen? For you at doing that, to have a millstone. Does anybody know what a millstone is? Do you, not, anybody use a millstone lately? We don't use that anymore, but it was those heavy, solid rock wheels to use to smash the grain. It would go around. I mean, they were huge. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds used. And this is what it says in the Scripture. Do you all think Scripture is wonderful and rosy and beautiful, right? Did you read what I just read? It literally said to put one of those millstones, tie it to your neck, throw them in the sea. Wow, that's nice, right? That's an uplifting message. That's what it says of a culture of people that will lead their young people astray from who the true God is. What do you think is going on with us, this world we're living in right now? You know, we read in the scriptures of the wrath of God and how his hand comes down in judgment and all those kind of things. You think we're going to feel that? 
Let me just tell you, we are. However, God calls for his remnant. Do you know what a remnant is? It says in the scripture that his remnant, those who are saved through Jesus Christ, his blood, his children, his people are going to stand and be strong even in the midst of the worst of times. That's why as a preacher, when I pray in my office, when I think on you, when I look at the names of the list of everybody in this church family and I pray over your names, I pray that God make us warriors. That God makes us strong. That God will use us to be a light in the midst of the darkness. School's getting ready to start, did y'all know? Any teachers realize that? Look at my wife, she starts tomorrow. High school starts when? Tomorrow, right? Grade schools, all that. Our prayer is that God will use you. The preacher most likely isn't going to be walking up and down the hallways at Mount Vernon High School. Maybe sometimes. But you are going to be there every day. God calls you to be his ministers and to do those things. The next part we look at here is that rebuke is not a bad word. Okay? We're anti-cultural to that, right? Saying something of that nature. Because we talk about rebuke. Well, you can't rebuke somebody. You can't get on somebody. You can't correct somebody. And then I, I went through a master's teaching program to be certified in the state of Illinois to teach. And they were telling me in there that I can't even correct the language of, of, of a child I'm teaching. Or if they want to use foul language or something of that nature, that I shouldn't correct them because that's just their language. God teaches us something quite different. God teaches us that we should mold and make and create. I want to tell you, when I was a young man, especially a teenager, one of the people that I disliked most in this world, guess who it was? My dad! All right, he was always getting on me. He was always telling me to mow the grass or something. He was always giving me a hard time. He wouldn't let me go and do the things I wanted. He made me come home at a certain time of night. He did all these things to me. How terrible is he? All right? And now today, as an older man, man, I miss him so bad. I absolutely love him for keeping me in the right path. For teaching me the ways of the Father. Showing me the love of Jesus. Praise God. But that's what he calls us to continue to do. So this idea of rebuke. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Did you know that part? It doesn't just say forgive him. It says, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day... And seven times comes back to you and says, I repent. Forget it. Don't forgive him, right? That's not what it says. What did it say? All right. So they sin against you seven times in one day. And they come back to you and say, forgive me. I, I repent. What are we supposed to do? It says to forgive. What's the idea? The idea is one, one is that we're going to rebuke, meaning that we're going to call them to appropriate action. It says that we're to forgive, but there was something that took place before the forgiveness. What did it say? And if he what? Repents. Now, do you catch this as a little bit of an oxymoron, right? Because what does the word repent mean? Have you ever heard that definition? Yeah, it means to do a 180 turn and go the opposite way from that sin or that temptation. You're not going to dabble in it. You're going to turn and walk away from it. That's what it means to repent. I've heard some people say it means to do a 360. No, it does not. (laughs) Now, apparently the guy that Jesus was speaking to that says if he comes seven times, thinks it's a 360. It's a 180. You're not supposed to just spin around in a circle and do the same thing over and over and over again. And I'm here, and I know you're here as well. Don't we get frustrated uh, when you tell somebody, don't do that? 
And what do they do? They turn around and do it again. Man, I can understand why my dad was on me all the time. Because he'd be like, don't, don't touch that stove. Oh, okay, I, I, I won't do it, Dad. I won't do it. And as soon as he turned around, I'd be, I was that kid, okay? I'm that guy. Fortunately, God, uh, my dad kind of shaped me to learn how to handle those sorts of things and, and not to do that all the time. But this is what it says in the Scripture. Forgive. Continue to forgive Continue to rebuke. It's an ongoing circular process. That's why we continue to do church together. Because I have yet to see anybody that I've worked with in church or pastoring make it to the art of perfection while they're still breathing and being a part of the church family. Now, some of you are getting a little closer, okay? But nobody's made it. Why is that? Because we haven't taken our last breath. The victory is not ours in Jesus Christ eternally. It is in that we've accepted Jesus, but it's not yet our time to be home with him in heaven. Here's the key. It says, faith is the seed, and this is what it says. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. All right, so who are the apostles? You remember? Twelve men that Jesus was teaching hands-on every single day, rubbing shoulders with them. They ask this, increase our faith. Anybody here in this room need to say that? Here, let me say it. Increase my faith, Lord Jesus. I always loved the dad when he's talking about the son that was demon-possessed. And Jesus said, well, don't you have faith that I can heal him? And you remember what the dad said? I believe. Help me to believe. It's one of the best Christian prayers we can pray. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I have the faith of a mustard seed. Help me to believe, to be strong in you, Jesus. This is the whole idea of this mustard seed picture. Verse 6, we hear it again in Luke. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Man, doesn't that sound awesome? I was moving some railroad timbers. You ever move a railroad timber? All right. These railroad timbers are anywhere from 10 to 12 foot long. They weigh well over 500 pounds. And I'm trying to do it by myself. Anybody notice that sometimes I'm kind of an idiot? So I'm trying to move this thing by myself. Where, why wasn't I reading the scripture like this? Why wasn't I praying? If I had faith as small as mustard, say, I'd say, Timber, you go and be right there. Is that what we're reading in the scriptures here when we hear an illustration like that? What that passage literally spells out to us is that this morning in this room, you've come to church for some reason. However you've got, gotten here, or we're all here in this room together, God's put it in this place to worship, to hear. If we have the faith of a mustard seed, now understand... I'm not talking about faith for your self-esteem or to make you feel better or to pat you on the back. Now, if you want a hug this morning, I give you a hug. If you, if you need somebody to pat you on the back, I'll pat you on the back. But as a preacher up here in this, on the stage today, my responsibility is to tell you that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed in Jesus Christ... Not in Randy Steele, not in Southwest Christian Church, not in your own abilities or what you think you, you are, but in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You know, I think it'd be a good exercise if we just, if we just said Jesus. Jesus. There's something very powerful about that name. You know what that, what that is? It's the name of Jesus, the creator, the way, the life in Jesus. If you want hope, you want understanding, you want to know what it is that God's created you for, find Jesus first, then figure out all the rest. In the scriptures, when it talked about that this seed that's been planted, it's this picture 
of faith. I made a, I looked for an acrostic this last week to kind of spell it out. Couldn't find a good one that I like. So this is what I came up with. Faith is finding an inner truth and hope. Think about that for a moment. It tells us in the Word today that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, the idea is that that seed has to be there inside of you. And that seed will grow. If you nurture that seed, if you take the time here in church, outside of this place, and nurture it, that's going to grow. And guess what it's going to do? It's going to start taking over the discontentment. It's going to start taking over the disharmony. It's going to start taking over these feelings of worthlessness. It's going to start taking over all those things. I told you at the age of 17, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm not talking about the idea of, hey, I like Jesus in church kind of thing. I'm talking about at the age of 17, I said, Jesus Christ, I desperately need you. I surrender my life to you. I want to be a part of you, Jesus Christ. From that moment, I didn't cry myself to sleep anymore. I prayed myself to sleep. I talked to my Savior, to my God, every night as we went to bed. And when I woke up morning, I would say, good morning, Lord. I praise and worship you. I still try to practice that every single day. Faith is finding an inner truth and hope. Think about it one more time. Ecclesiastes, Solomon, we've been reading it in our Bible reading. If you're on that daily Bible reading plan, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says that we have been created in the image of God and that it has been written on our physical hearts, our bodies, the idea of eternity. That's why all mankind, whether they know the truth that we're talking about in this room or not, know that there's something more beyond just this physical body that we see. God has put a soul, Jesus has put a soul in every person. And that soul cries out to his creator. This morning I want to encourage you, if you got faith as small as a mustard seed, let it continue to work. The last scripture we're reading today, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, tells you this to each of us in this room with that little seed, that mustard seed, to be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men, I'll add women here to be men, women of courage, be strong, do everything in love. Are you catching it? So you got that seed of faith in you. Guard it, nurture it, use it. If you'll do those three things, you're going to see that faith continue to grow and grow. That first picture I shared up here on the screen was a map of, or was a, the flag of Tanzania. Uh, again, I don't know. I don't know where, why it was that country, why it was that missionary, Jeff, why it was that work that the church started, but we were faithful in it. <clears throat> we did it. We planted that small seed. We allowed that faith to grow. And I've said this many a times up from up here. That very first time I left, I went by myself, never traveled outside of the, a country that was attached to the U.S. You know what I mean by that Mexico, Canada kind of thing. i never been anywhere like that. And I went off. And do any of you recall how, how we left and I got up and I was like, man, I am a man of God. And I'm going in the power of Jesus. Wasn't that right? Was that the way it happened? The stories get better with the years. No, I told you all from the straight get-go. I was scared. I was nervous. A large part of me didn't want to do it. I was looking for those knowledgeable ways to talk myself out of it or to figure out a way not to do it. But we did. And I did. And man, you want to talk about a seed growing. I think we're up past six foot already, maybe heading towards that 30 foot. But it said in the scriptures that it becomes the largest of the plants in the garden. 
and that the birds literally come to perch in that tree. Is that what we want to be? Absolutely. I don't think there's anybody here that says, I don't want that. No, we want our faith to grow. So I want to encourage you, as a pastor to a church family, grow. Be courageous. Step out in faith. And when you think you can't do it, well, that's when you do it. Because when you think you can't, guess what? God can. And man, that allows our faith to grow tremendously. So let me pray over you. I want to encourage you in that faith and to let that mustard seed grow this morning. Father God, as we come before you, we come before you as men and women that are in desperate need of a Savior. And that Savior is you, Jesus Christ. You are the answer. We bow before you. We, we bow our heads. We worship you because you're the only one worthy of worship. Lord, this, this seed of faith, this mustard seed that you pictured or illustrated for us, we want to see that seed grow. Help us to be disciplined. Help us to trust. Help us to nurture. Help us to stay faithful. Help us to encourage and be around Christian brothers and sisters. Help us to step out in faith and do the things that you're calling us to. Let our faith grow that people may see who you are, what you've done, and what you continue to do. Your word tells us that if you, Jesus Christ, be lifted up, all men will be drawn to you. So we proclaim your name, Jesus. We lift your name up, Jesus. We proclaim you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We will say Jesus with our final breath, Jesus. Praise and honor and glory be to you. It's in your all-powerful name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Do you please stand if you can or kneel if you want? As we sing this last song, I want to strongly encourage you. I know sometimes... We may not know the songs that well. They may not be that familiar to us. But man, have you looked at the words that were in the lyrics? The power and the message of the truth that is in the words that you're singing? I want to encourage you. The speakers are playing pretty loud. Sing it out. Probably only the person maybe in front of you can hear you. So don't worry about it. Just sing the words. Think about the words Think about the power and the truth and let your faith grow as we sing this song of invitation. Just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. And just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. And just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. 
There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a prison wall He can't break through Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. It's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name. That makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do No, there's nothing that our God can't do There's not a prison wall He can't break through Oh, praise the name That makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Oh, 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 oh. singing out nice and loud, right? I turn off my microphone so you don't have to hear me singing, but I try to sing it out loud. You know, I oftentimes wonder if I, if I was a brand new person to walk into church, and I was sitting in the back of church, and I just watched, just watched, you know, everybody in church that are Christian men and women, if I was watching from the back and I didn't know Jesus, would I want to wa know Jesus from watching your love and worship of him let that think about that let that kind of sink in i'm not saying i was watching or looking at anybody today but i'm saying just think on that you know the power of that along the lines of power of faith in our bulletin there's a small little thing in the prayer request section that says if there's something that you want prayer for maybe there's some healing that you're wanting uh some sickness some tests things you're dealing with finances, struggles, you know, whatever it is, if there's something that feelings or emotion you're having troubles with, doesn't it say in the scriptures that if you have those kind of things, what does it say to do about it? Well, it says to pray, but it also says, ask the elders, deacons, the leadership of your church family to lay hands on you and pray in faith over those things. Why is it that things don't seem to work out all the time? Did we not start there? Do you start with prayer? So I'm encouraging church. If there's something, let's pray on it today. Stay after here at service. We'll, leadership, family will pray over you. Uh, we have anointing oil. We'll lift holy hands in prayer. As the scripture says, we'll do it the way God teaches us. Sound good? Okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Announcements. Back to school. Tonight. 7 to 8 p.m. We have our Gen G. How do you say that? Gen X. Gen X. Youth. Youth group meeting at 7 o'clock here tonight. Bible study 930. We do have a lifeboat meal coming up on the 22nd. Any other announcements I missed? Do we be in prayer for a couple? I know Glenda asked us to keep Henry in prayer. He's having real bad sciatica nerve problems and unable to be here today and also Jim Dennis took a fall yesterday 
kind of bruised up his ribs as far as we know and want to keep can you keep him in prayer anything else let me pray and we'll go ahead and turn it back over to Cody and crew father we give you the honor the glory the praise thank you again for faith help our mustard seed faith to grow may there be power through you for us as we go out and live it amongst this world it's in your name Jesus we pray Amen. You guys are all dismissed. You guys have a blessed week.